Good evening. I'm Kelly Wright. Thanks for being part of us. I hope you enjoyed a great weekend, and I hope you are safe and well. Speaking of the weekend, it leads to my opening observations. Because over this past weekend, the former president of the United States, Barack Obama, gave an address, a graduation address, to the 2020 high school graduates. Here's some of what he said. He stated, this pandemic has shaken up the status quo and laid bare a lot of our country's deep-seated problems, from massive economic inequality to ongoing racial disparities to a lack of basic health care for people who need it. That, my friends, is something we've been talking about on this show from day one when we launched on the Black News Channel. And the Black News Channel has been talking about the illuminated truth. And it is indeed the illuminated truth that this virus has exposed our deep-seated problems and we must continue to deal with it. But let me not digress from what the former president of the United States stated. And here now is an excerpt from his own lips in terms of what he had to say to advise the young people to keep it moving. You won't get it right every time. You'll make mistakes like we all do. But if you listen to the truth that's inside yourself, even when it's hard, even when it's inconvenient, people will notice. They'll gravitate towards you. And you'll be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. And finally, build a community. No one does big things by themselves. Right now, when people are scared, it's easy to be cynical and say, let me just look out for myself or my family or people who look or think or pray like me. But if we're going to get through these difficult times, if we're going to create a world where everybody has opportunity to find a job and afford college, if we're going to save the environment and defeat future pandemics, then we're going to have to do it together. So be alive to one another's struggles. Stand up for one another's rights. Leave behind all the old ways of thinking that divide us. Sexism, racial prejudice, status, greed, and set the world on a different path. Thank you, Mr. Barack Obama, for encouraging young people throughout America. And those are my opening observations. You're watching The Kelly Wright Show. We'll be back with more after this. So welcome to the program, and tonight we want to focus on what's happening with the stimulus package, also what's going on in terms of how Congress is trying to address the needs of the American people, and what better way to do that than to talk to the chairman of the Education and Labor Committee in Congress, and that is Congressman Bobby Scott of the Great Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, Congressman, good of you to join us today and to weigh in on these myriad of issues that still plague us due to the pandemic. Uh, let's start with the stimulus because a lot of American people are still saying we still don't have enough uh, money to conduct our business, to conduct our education, to just live. What are your concerns about that, sir? Well, the first part of it is the economy. We have a consumer-based economy and as, as businesses are shut down, uh, people need to make sure, we need to make sure that people maintain their income. Otherwise, they can't pay their rent, they can't buy food, they can't pay their bills, and you have a, um, a real problem throughout the economy. To the extent people can maintain their incomes, we eliminate a lot of those problems. That's why it was so important to send out the $1,200 uh, stimulus checks and $500 for dependent children uh, so that people would have some money. And for those that lose their jobs, uh, make sure they have um, uh, adequate unemployment compensation. States like Virginia, the unemployment compensation is woefully inadequate. Yeah. And so the federal government, for those on unemployment, uh, had a plus up of $600. It was not only enhanced, but also expanded. It covered a lot of people that have never gotten unemployment compensation before. Gig workers, self-employed, self independent contractors, were able to qualify for unemployment compensation, including 
the six hundred dollars. So that for for a lot of people allowed them to maintain their income and pay their bills. Uh, without that, it's hard to say uh, what would have had. We couldn't have gotten through this without the twelve hundred dollar checks and the uh, uh, enhanced uh, and expanded unemployment compensation. That was a huge uh, portion of the um, of, of, of the proposal. So, so where are we now in terms of this new proposal that will ultimately, I, I believe, get passed there in the House? But then you have to go to the Senate, and the Senate is a, a bit uh, a bit skeptical of this particular one because it's such a massive amount of money. Well, it, it, if you look at the problem that we have compared to the um, uh, need to actually address it. If you look, we, we, have, we have about a $20 trillion debt. We're not gonna double the debt. Uh, you would think that we've had uh, almost 20 years of fairly good economy. Uh, we should have paid down the debt when President Clinton left office. We were on track to paying off the entire debt held by the public by, uh, by about 20, 2008 all the money back in the trust funds by 2013. So we, we had the capability of actually paying down the debt. Um, what we need to do now is address the fact that this is the worst economic uh, problem we've had since the Great Depression. The number of people applying for unemployment is, uh, the, the New York Times had a, had a graph on the front page. They had a little squiggly line on the top of the, week, of the monthly uh, un, uh, loss of jobs. And then right at the end, this month, all the way down the page, something so far unprecedented um, that, it, that it was hard to even display. The previous record of unemployment uh, claims in a week was 600 and some thousand during the 08, 09 recession. The, the record since they've been keeping numbers, 600 and some thousand. We've had several weeks in a row between three and six million yeah. Back to back to back to back to back. And so the, uh, uh, the, the problem with the economy is immense and we have to have a response that, is, uh, uh, that has the same magnitude as the problem. And so these, um, we've kept the um, uh, economy uh, afloat. People have maintained their incomes. The next step is to make sure that we extend that the pandemic is going longer than we than we'd hoped. Uh, yep. We need to maintain the unemployment compensation. We need another round, round of checks. We need education money. But the number one thing we need is money going to state and local governments. Uh, Virginia actually was a perfect example of what uh, the states are going through because our General Assembly session ended just as the pandemic was starting. And so we saw what a budget was supposed to look like. Six weeks later, the procedure is that the General Assembly reconvenes to consider amendments by the governor and the governor's vetoes. During that time, of course, by, the, by then we're in the middle of the pandemic, the revenue estimates have changed. Yes. I said the Education and Labor Committee, I looked at the education part of the budget, I noticed that the 2% raise for teachers this year and next year evaporated. Counselors in elementary schools evaporated. Freeze on tuition in colleges evaporated. One college lost $100 million in construction funds evaporated. If we can get money, if we could restore the revenue losses to states and local, all those kinds of funding can go back. That's just the state budget. On a local level, a substantial portion of the uh, budget is education. You can't have significant cuts uh, in, in your budget without affecting education uh, costs. You can't do it without laying off teachers and expanding uh, uh, class sizes. So, and so the state and local government is the number one uh, priority. If we can do that, then we can put more money in education and it would actually be a plus. Uh, students um, need summer programs to make up for the time they've, they've, they've already had their summer. Uh, this thing called summer slide, people kind of regress during the summer, they've already had that. We got to get back in, 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 in summer programs. We need to address the achievement gap. We need technology uh, for distance learning. We need to address the problems of special, of a special education students. There's a lot we need the education, but whatever we put into education, if we don't do the state and local revenue shortfalls, we'll just be backfilling what they're cutting, and we won't even be trading water. So the number one priority is state and local funding then education, 
and then uh, and then the uh, continue the um, enhanced unemployment compensation, maybe another round of um, uh, of new checks. Um, we need we need to make sure that uh, uh, people who lose their jobs. We've got about thirty some million people have lost their jobs in the last few weeks. Regrettably, in, in America, when you lose your job, you lose your health insurance. Yes. There is a provision that you can keep your health insurance. All you have to do is pay the premiums, and you can stay on, on your on your policy. Those premiums could be five hundred, a thousand, even fifteen hundred dollars a month. If you just lost your job, you don't have fifteen hundred dollars a month. That's a, it's a breathtaking, massive bill. I, I've got to ask you, is $3 trillion enough? I think most of the economists are talking in the $3 trillion uh, level as the appropriate uh, size uh, at this point. If it goes much longer, we might have to come back. Yeah. Uh, but if, if we, if the, the alternative is if we don't, the economy tanks to the point where you may not be able to, uh, to recover. A lot of businesses already are expected um, uh, not to come back. Uh, and if, you, if it goes much further in depth, a lot of businesses will go under major uh, businesses. A couple of uh, major uh, uh, companies have already filed for bankruptcy. Uh, if it goes, if we do not have uh, consumers buying things, uh, many, many others will, 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 will follow suit. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the response that is uh, consistent with the problem that we have. And if we do that, we'll be able to get through it. You know, that, that goes to the point uh, of concern that with businesses, some businesses closing and perhaps never being able to repair, or re repair the breach, there it's, uh, there's a business that's going on in African-American communities and brown communities whereby they're not getting access to the capital that they need to sustain or even stay in the game, so to speak. So do you have some concerns about the adverse effects of the disparities that this coronavirus has caused? Well, one of the things about this um, pandemic is that it exposes uh, disparities all through the system. Yeah. Disproportionate deaths uh, are attributed to underlying disparities in healthcare, uh, disparities in education, uh, some are getting distance learning, others because they don't have the devices, don't, don't have connectivity, are being left behind. Those kind of disparities are all over the place. And in business, yeah, there's a, there's dis there are disparities in access to capital. The first go round, it was no question that if you had a favored relationship with a bank, you were in the front of the line. And if you didn't, if you're small, particularly the smallest businesses, uh, you never, the money ran out before it got to you. Uh, we restored a lot of them, we, we replenished a lot of the money, and it's my understanding now that money may be still available, people should apply, um, and um, hopefully, and, and we also put money into uh, financial institutions in the community, not just the big banks, but uh, in the community, with the expectation that the smaller businesses would have a better chance. Uh, it, it appears to be working. The average size of the loans uh, was cut in half. I think the, 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 so there are many more smaller loans been given. In this package, we put in a little more money targeted for the smallest businesses. I mean, we're, we're talking about small restaurants, barbershops, yeah, uh, things, yeah. like, things like that. Those are the ones that with a little help can stay open and without help, you know, they're out of business. And, and so that was a target. It wasn't the publicly held corporations that have access to capital and it, it, today's uh, uh, interest rates, they can borrow it with very reasonable interest rates. Uh, we wanted to make sure this capital was available. To a large extent, uh, to, to some extent, the loans don't even have to be paid back. If you use it, it's called the PVP, Payroll Protection Program. If you use it to keep people on your payroll and don't lay them off, Mm -hmm. uh, then you don't have to pay the money back. And that, that was one of the reasons uh, we promoted the plan because it's not aimed at uh, propping up the corporation, it's aimed at keeping people on the job and keeping their income uh, flowing so that they don't have the problems that occur 
when you lose your lose your income. You're watching The Kelly Wright Show. We'll be back with much more after the break. Congressman, you talked about education uh, a little bit earlier in our conversation. And I, I wanted to ask you about, in particular, the HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, because they, they are institutions that have been the bedrock, if you will, of many uh, African-Americans being able to get into the middle class and some going on to break through the glass ceiling with uh, successful businesses and medical practices. And yet we know that they are troubled right now because of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic's impact on the economy. Uh, now I've heard from the White House that uh, the president has appointed Republican Senator Tim Scott to look at and figure out how to, uh, to create an initiative that will revitalize the economy or the funding for HBCUs. Have you heard about that? Has the, the senator reached out to you, knowing that you sit on as the chair of the Education and Labor Committee? And, and if he has not, what might we see in terms of a bipartisanship approach to salvage historically black colleges and universities, which may be in deep trouble because of this economy? Well, all of the colleges need help. And we've been the CARES Act, we passed significant funding uh, for higher education. Uh, they, they are trying to deal with the fact that students aren't there, the dormitories are empty, they still have uh, debt service on those dormitories, they're trying to keep their faculty intact um, with no money coming in. The uh, colleges are in desperate need for assistance and the CARES Act provided significant funding for all colleges. It provided uh, uh, extra funding for those struggling colleges, particularly HBCUs, uh, and they received uh, significant funding under the CARES Act already. Uh, under this bill, they will continue to get additional funding. The HBCUs, as you have indicated, have been uh, important in the African-American community and in and, and the community generally. Yes. Um, yes. Because a lot of them, uh, I don't know if any of them are solely African-American. I mean, so like, uh, at least a couple who operated during segregation and were designated as historically uh, black institutions during segregation. Uh, they need significant funding to make up for the capital that they didn't get uh, during segregation. And, and so that designation has helped them get funding. Uh, but as you have indicated, it's a step, going to college is an important step into the middle class. Uh, so you don't, doesn't necessarily need to be a four year liberal arts degree but some education and training past the high school level is essential to move up in the economic, uh, on the economic ladder. And those opportunities have to be there. That's why we've, uh, we're considering uh, the College Affordability Act and the Education and uh, Labor Committee. We've reported it out of committee. Uh, we're trying to get it. We were in the process of bringing it to the floor um, when the pandemic hit and all of the attention quite frankly, has shifted to uh, dealing with this, uh, with the pandemic. Hopefully we can get back to the College Affordability Act, which allows people to go to college in, a, in an affordable way uh, with a little, if you're willing to work 15 hours a week, you should be able to get through college with no debt at all. Uh, it helps people to pay off student, student, uh, student loans. Uh, it helps uh, colleges uh, provide the education. So, I mean, there's a lot in that bill to um, offer opportunities. But uh, as you've indicated, HBCUs are an important part of that, and they have been recognized both in the CARES Act and in this legislation. Very good, and Congressman, I, I wanna thank you for uh, spending so much time with me uh, to talk about all of these uh, different, different uh, problems and issues, and yet uh, we can see from your proactivity that uh, you are hard at work, along with your colleagues there in the House to actually get something Implement it that will help Americans as we deal with this unprecedented issue of COVID-19. I'm going to ask you, do you, how do you see things playing out uh, with this? I, I mean, you don't have a crystal ball. Uh, there are a lot of people on Capitol Hill who have to vote on this issue. Then it has to go to the Senate. 
but, but more importantly, how do you see it as a member of Congress, uh, as someone there in the Commonwealth and you're seeing it reopening in phases and yet Northern Virginia, because of its uh, population des density, can't reopen fully. We have to keep uh, implementing safe measures there as well as in the nation's capital, like you're doing yourself there as a member of Congress working in the seat uh, of, uh, of Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, people are shaking their heads saying, what do we do? And, and well, well, I, guess I think if you just back up and listen to the scientists, uh, Dr. Fauci testified uh, the other day and, and, and laid out the science. Uh, if you just back off and just listen to the science and follow the evidence and research and scientific advice, you'll do the right thing. When you get politicians trying to figure out what's the popular thing to do, uh, that's when you get, 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 get in trouble. Uh, in terms of what happens to the legislation, um, the Senate has indicated that they're not uh, uh, supportive of the legislation now. The president has indicated he might even veto it, but that is before the Republican mayors and governors look at what they have to do to their budgets if this bill does not pass. If this bill passes, uh, Virginia can restore all those cuts in education and all through the budget. Uh, the uh, local cities don't have to fire teachers and police officers uh, if this bill passes. And if, the, if it doesn't pass, they will be facing uh, draconian cuts to, 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 to their budgets. Um, those Republican mayors and those Republican governors will be whispering to the senators and to the president that they desperately need this money. And uh, I think they'll see to it. It may not pass exactly as we pass it, but I think a substantial portion of it, particularly the aid to um, uh, state and local government and the individual assistance um, and the um, uh, healthcare portions of it, I think those, uh, it's gonna be hard to see how you can, pass, how you can, how they can sit, a, sit, sit, sit by and allow the economy to go in the tank uh, without addressing the pressing needs. So I'm, I'm although the, you've got the rhetoric uh, of flourishes going on now, uh, after we pass the bill and it's sitting over there, the governors and the mayors will be, uh, will light up the uh, phones and the, uh, I think the senators will feel compelled uh, to take some action. Congressman Bobby Scott, thank you, sir. Chairman of the Education and Labor Committee there on the House side and uh, we'll continue to follow the developments and uh, never be a stranger to this program. You're always welcome here. And, uh, and I like what you said earlier, uh, we gotta get rid of the politics and focus on the science. Appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Stay safe. Okay. You too. Back with more of the program after this. Welcome back to the program. So we've talked enough about politics. Now let's talk about someone who knows the political arena, but I want to talk to her about the inspirational arena in which she's engaged. Dr. Avis Jones de Weaver is a media monetization mentor. She's a media commentator, an award-winning author, international speaker. In fact, she is a book about how exceptional black women lead. And she is also an international and TEDx speaker media commentator. She's been on the program before, so I'm welcoming back a good old friend. And my friend, it's good to see you, and you look beautiful, marvelous, and healthy. Thank you, and you look handsome, marvelous, and healthy, and it's great to be back. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I'm glad you're safe and well. Tell me about um, your book and your movement to help lead Black women and to empower them to become greater entrepreneurs, greater people of influence. What, what's that all about? Because I, I can just see so many people really gravitating towards your message. Absolutely. So what inspired me to write How Exceptional Black Women Lead uh, really was my time that I spent at the National Council of Negro Women many years ago. I worked under the amazing Dr. Dorothy Hyde, who is um, just a history maker in so many respects as it relates to both women's rights and civil rights. And I had the opportunity to work with her there, but also eventually ascend to the role of executive director, unfortunately, upon her passing. 
And through that work, I was able to connect with and get to know and be inspired by so many Black women uh, throughout the nation and internationally who are doing such amazing things. And it, I thought about how powerful it would be to have in one place something like a roadmap that I could share with other Black women, particularly those who are, you know, starting their careers or those who are looking to make career transitions or move into entrepreneurship. What if I spoke to a lot of these exceptional Black women that I knew and sort of shared their secrets? And so the book is basically a compilation of over 75 interviews. I kind of condensed over 75 interviews I did with amazing Black women in various fields to give that sort of secret plan to other Black women who want to know how to accelerate their path to success. A secret plan, but the secret yeah. is out now. <laughs> the secret is out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, what's the secret you find in terms of bringing more out of Black women to lead in this time of a crisis with this COVID-19 pandemic? Mm -hmm. So this is, you're, you know, that's such an important question because in many ways we are living in a re reality right now where up is down and down is up. None of us alive have ever experienced anything like this before. And I think one of the things that's very important for us as Black women to really realize in this moment is that at least is the fact that we still have power over our own destiny. Mm -hmm. And we still have the ability to create our reality. And in many ways, though this is a crisis, this is also a moment of opportunity. If we look at this specific moment and say, with this gift of time that we've been given, because that's how I look at this. You know, yes, we've had to put our lives on pause and we're beginning to sort of roll things back out, but we've also been given a gift of time. So now is the moment where we can say, is there something that I've always wanted to do? Is there a talent in me, a desire in me that I've always had, but I've already always told myself for years, I didn't have time. Well, listen, now you have time and let's figure out how we can best maximize this time to really get on the path to your destiny and to begin to make that destiny a reality. Now, are you available for talking to women who are seeking that time to evaluate their lives and, and figure out the next best step forward? Absolutely. So they can, you know, any of your viewers can go to blackwomenlead.com. They can get more information about the book. And they can also leave me a message there if they want more information. And I would definitely be more than happy to talk with them and help them to sort of begin to sort of unravel, unravel that for themselves. Because I really believe that, you know, out of this moment, so much new um, ideas and desires and dreams will be birthed. And now's the time to make it happen. You know, I, I have missed you being on the program and it's good to have you back because you still have that uh, effervescence of positivity. So hold that book up so we can see it again. Yes, uh, I am so there happy. This is it. <laughs> you can <laughs> grab it at Amazon or you can go straight to blackwomenlead.com and grab it there. Black Women Lead and certainly you're leading them as well. Oh, Dr. No. Abel Jones de Weaver, always good to have you back. Come on back anytime. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right. God Take bless care. you. Stay safe. All right. You too, dear. Take care. Back with more of the program after this. There is a new film that's out. And they have a novel approach of getting you engaged, actively engaged in watching this documentary. It's about the life and the unfortunate uh, death of Eric Garner. Many of you will recall that case when Eric Garner was placed in a chokehold by a police officer. Many officers took him down on the ground over cigarettes, loose leaf cigarettes. And Eric Garner is heard screaming, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. It resulted in his death. So now there's a film about that that's called uh, The American Trial. And you, the people, will decide in watching this trial, you will decide the verdict. So joining me now is Scott Glosserman of Gather Films. And Scott, thanks for being on the program today. Thanks so much for having me. It's really good to have you. This is, this is quite um, an unusual taking uh, and an, an unusual approach that you're doing to get people to watch this film about a page in history that is indelible in the hearts and minds of so many Americans, 
particularly African Americans who are extremely concerned about racial justice, as you know, and, and the encounters that we have with police officers and how it can go sideways, fast, quick, and in a hurry. What, what do you say about the overall aspects of this film and the fact that they're actually taking real life uh, attorneys to make the case uh, and then they have, the only actor in it is, as I understand, is the actor who plays the part of the, of the police officer who actually put Eric Garner in that uh, chokehold. That's right, R real life witnesses as well. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a trial that the filmmakers and, and the people uh, who, who were affected by this um, most directly felt needed to happen. And we are humbled to be able to distribute it in a, in a truly innovative way. What's, what's fascinating about the, the whole confluence of events here is that because um, we can't get into theaters, this would typically have its normal theatrical run and be feted by the newspaper reviews and, and all the various film festival accolades that go around. But because we can't do that right now, we've had to, in a hurry, come up with a virtual event cinema opportunity. And, and we've created that very quickly. But the reason why it's so um, opportunistic for this particular film is that there is an interactive component where you, the audience, can vote on the verdicts. And, uh, and that's, so, that's so unusual. Sometimes at film festivals, one gets to vote for an audience ballot, but you certainly don't get the results instantaneously. So we intend on May 21st to read the verdicts um, as they're tabulated. So this is going on right now. How can people get to the film uh, through your company to actually watch it and then get ready to vote and well, actually to give their verdict of guilty or not guilty? People can go to gather.com. There's, there's no E in gather. Uh, this is G-A-T-H-R.com. And at gather.com, uh, you can click on uh, Gather at Home, which is our virtual cinema distribution platform. And, and there you can uh, see where the, the listings and reserve a ticket. And, and on May 21st, we will auto play the film. So everybody sees this film as though it were a live setting. The film starts at the same time for everyone. It's followed by a live discussion and Q and A with um, um, Eric's widow and uh, a couple other people who are closely involved uh, with the film and with the incident. Um, and, and afterwards, uh, and, or during, I should say, uh, you can vote on the verdict and that's part of that's part of this event it, it is it looks to be a very profound film that uh it's extremely timely right now because of what's happened in recent weeks with the ahmed uh, arbery case so i want to take a break right now and show the actual uh, uh uh trailer if you will we're going to take a look at that right now and i'll come back to you and ask you again to remind people what they can do to be a part of this film and this unique novel way of distributing it. So let's take a look at American Trial right now. Time for remorse would have been when my husband was yelling to breathe. He was murdered. The grand jury has found the evidence is just not there. Not to indict. To refuse to indict. No indictment. No indictment. Thank you, Mrs. Garner, for coming in. I appreciate it. Uh, we wanted to have the opportunity to just go over some of the charges that we're prepared to go forward on. Strangulation in the first degree. And that's obvious because that's exactly what happened. Is it over after that? Mr. Pantaleo, will you please stand? Has the jury reached a verdict? Yes, we have, Your Honor. What is your verdict? So I'm back now with Scott Glosserman, who is the CEO of Gather Films. And, and Scott, that is a riveting trailer. You actually see Eric Garner's wife on the stand. You see other members of that community on the stand. And you see real live uh, attorneys uh, not acting it out, but actually conducting a trial. And the only actor in this case, as I've stated, is the police officer who was 
uh, involved in that uh, in that hole that resulted in Eric Garner's death, that chokehold. Um, how can we see the film again, and and when can people expect to render a verdict of this trial? Well, there are there are a few different ways to see the film. The most direct one is to go to gather.com, G-A-T-H-R, no E, and uh, click on uh, Gather at Home on, on the event listings. And uh, the first two will be uh, two different screenings uh, on May 21st, one for Pacific time, one for East Coast time, in, in case you don't want to stay up that late. Mm -hmm. um, the same discussion Q&A, the same guests will take part in both. So you're not going to miss anything. And, uh, and as the film ends, and as the discussion and Q&A begins on this event watch page, you'll have an opportunity to um, vote yourself on the verdicts. Uh, Scott Glosserman, thank you for bringing us to our attention. Thank uh, you. Gather Films, and of course, uh, we'll be talking to the actual uh, people who are part of the film uh, in the days to come, but we appreciate you. And what a novel way to really distribute this so that people have, it, have access to it and can watch it, especially in this uh, heightened season of coronavirus. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. All right. Thanks, Scott. We'll be back with more of the program after this. back to the program there's a lot to talk about when it comes to family matters and as you know it's all about strengthening the family especially given the time that we're living in and and because of the COVID-19 there's the distress that comes from it and wrecking your economy wreaking havoc on your lifestyle if you're not accustomed to being at home with your children or let's say you have to move during this COVID-19 <laughs> <laughs> you hear them laughing. That's George and Tondra Gregory, uh, founders of Journey for Life, as well as uh, chaplains, uh, NFL chaplains for the NFL team, the Los Angeles Chargers, which is why they had to move. It's an essential job for them. So they had to get up out of their digs in Southern LA to move to another part of Southern California. Guys, what's it like for a family to move during this heightened season of social distancing? What kind of stress does that cause a couple? <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a, well, you know, moving is stressful regardless, but trying to move with quarantine and pandemic and yeah. uh, just having to, you know, keep your social distancing, but you have to run and get all these uh, things in the public you know, uh, the stores and everything. So it, it, it adds another obstacle course uh, in order to yeah. <laughs> to complete your moving uh, experience. Your best advice to how families can, can actually keep each other lifted up when they've lost loved ones due to this coronavirus. We, um, uh, on another episode, we mentioned that we do a family Zoom call. Uh, our, our father just passed um, and in, in Feb on February 10th, uh, and he very well could have been, uh, COVID-19 could have been a part of his, his passing. But we, we get on a Zoom call as a family. Um, this weekend when we were moving, we, t we still took time to look at old photos and share those old photos. So we took pictures of the photos and sent them to the rest of the family. And, you know, our family loved to remember our dad. He's our hero and yet he's gone and we're living in a new norm. But instead of letting it take us down, yeah. we're actually letting it bring us together. Yes. Wow, that is so important, guys. Uh, George and Tondra, I mean, every time you come on, you, you uh, bring us a little bit more light in uh, these dark times and a lot more hope instead of despair and certainly faith more than fear. I appreciate you guys so much. You're helping us strengthen our families and that's important because, you know, I always say it, we have to be family strong yep. and uh, we can go through it and, and, uh, and get into lockstep uh, through this lockdown, lockstep of doing something positive. And that's exactly what you're doing. So thanks for encouraging us today. Uh, no, we're looking forward to seeing you on Wednesday as well with more right. uh, of an update on how we can keep our family strengthened. And thank you for being um, 
so open with us about, you know, a, a personal loss that you experienced. I didn't, I didn't realize that. So I, again, my, my, uh, my condolences to you, but, uh, man, am I am encouraged and, and, uh, and, and so thrilled that uh, your life has continued and you're giving, you're living out your, your dad's legacy, I would, I would su suspect. Yes, yes. Most definitely. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. George and Tondra Gregory. And where can we get you guys to follow you? Yeah, you can follow us. Uh, you can go to our website at journeyforlifenow.org or on IG. You can, uh, it's still Journey for Life Now. So important to follow because not only you are, are you advising people, but you're good relationship coaches, you're good life coaches. So we need all the coaching we can get yeah. in these tough times. So, yeah. and we do. in fact, in fact, Kelly, I just want to remind your audience that we, we are relationship coaches. And if someone's out there and they're in need of some coaching right now, or some encouragement, you know, we're, we're here. They can go to our website, journeyforlifenow.org. Uh, we have a relationship coaching tab that they can go. It's very easy to sign up, very easy. We have an assessment that they can take, yeah. and we can just start on day one helping to, to uh, look at their growth areas and, and really hone in where they need us. Yeah. Do it now, folks. Do it now, because we all can use some help. Yeah. Thank you so much. George and Tondra, we're back with more of the program after this. Welcome back. And now for my final word, I want to thank all the guests who appeared on today's program. And I want to thank you for taking the time out to watch us for this past hour. And to sum it all up, we are all engaged in this together. We can get through this virus and through the inequities and disparities that we have by setting a course for a different path. And that path should lead to a common good for the greater good of all. Hopefully you've been righted, ignited, and united to keep spreading, not fear, but love, freedom, and peace. Good night. Thank you.